move on to Halifax, Canada, to Professor Bal Shohan. He's Professor and Research Director of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences and Professor of Physiology and Biophysics at Dalhousie University. His clinical research interests center on changes in the visual field and optic nerve head in glaucoma. And he has advised new strategies to detect glaucomatous progression. So his talk today will be about perfusion density and structural OCT of the macula, which is more useful in early glaucoma, he's asking. So Bell, um, first of all, I uh, say hi, and I think we have a sound already. Hi to Canada, Bell. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon to you. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you um, to the organizers. Um, Please switch on your camera, Bell. Just switch on your camera so we can um, bring up yep. your picture. Yep, that's it. Lovely. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. And now good morning. comes the presentation. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, it's a strange way to present, but uh, it is what it is, and we must uh, carry on. Um, so, uh, my talk today uh, deals with uh, uh, OCT angiography uh, and uh, just some observations on uh, the relative value of OCT angiography compared to our uh, classical structural measurements uh, with OCT. Um, here are my disclosures, my competitive funding sources, the CIHR, Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation, and the Alcon Research Institute, and I also receive instrument support uh, from different companies. Now, um, as far as uh, the, um, um, uh, I can't seem to advance my slides here, um, Stefan, so um, here we go. As far as, um, yep, I have clicked it here. As far as OCT angiography goes, there's of course a tremendous interest in this technique, and this is just the number of citations in PubMed over the last few years, and you can see, a lot of interest in OCT angiography, also in glaucoma. And now when, the, the, when we see images like this, of course, it's uh, difficult not to be seduced uh, by, by the non-invasive nature in which we can visualize perfusion. And the question is, uh, you know, how useful is this in glaucoma? We know that it's useful in, in our retinal uh, applications, uh, but what about glaucoma? Now, um, when you look at uh, how um, OCT angiography is able to resolve the various different plexuses, the four different plexuses here, uh, on the top panel you can see at the level of the uh, optic nerve head and the bottom panel is at the level of the macula, uh, four distinct vascular plexuses that we can see. How are these affected in glaucoma? Um, so clearly uh, there should be a lot of interest in this. Uh, this is a terribly exciting um, technique to use. Now, when the first um, uh, data with OCT angiography came out, now six years ago, uh, this uh, rather impressive paper where they had a 100% actually uh, distinction between glaucoma patients and control subjects, the number of subjects was rather small, but you can see from the flow index over there that uh, in this particular study, they were actually able to obtain 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity in patients with relatively early visual field damage. And of course, there was a tremendous amount of excitement that went with this. Now, later studies have sort of been perhaps a little bit more realistic in the sense that the separation between healthy subjects and, and glaucoma subjects is not as great as was shown in the earlier studies. You can see here that there is actually quite a bit of overlap even between patients with relatively moderate to advanced glaucoma uh, compared to control subjects. And really, the question here is, is OCT angiography more sensitive in glaucoma? And uh, some of the, uh, the publications from San Diego actually have suggested this very clearly, uh, that potentially show the promise of identifying uh, glaucomatous damage before visual field damage are detectable in patients with uh, single hemifield defects. Um, subsequent papers uh, from the same group have actually used the longitudinal data uh, 
to actually suggest that serial measurements are also detected uh, without evidence of changes in ganglion cell uh, layer thickness. So the evidence really here suggests that um, perhaps this is the, a, a more sensitive technique than our conventional ones. The problem trying to compare um, ganglion cell thickness and perfusion density is that really are apples and oranges. How do we actually go about comparing these two very different things? So the approach that we have taken is to actually normalize them based on age-corrected values uh, from a normative population. We know both that the perfusion density and the ganglion cell layer thickness measurements are very dependent upon age. So uh, in this particular study, we corrected these for age, and then we computed a percentage loss value uh, for each uh, of these parameters. And essentially, um, our research questions were, uh, in patients with early uh, glaucoma, is there relatively more perfusion density loss compared to GCL thickness loss? And then more importantly, uh, are there variables that are associated uh, with patients who have a relatively greater perfusion density loss compared to GCL thickness loss. Of course, we don't have the benefit of longitudinal data, so we are all uh, obliged to work with cross-sectional data at this point. Just to some methodological details, the OCT area that scanned here is shown in blue, uh, or actually analyzed is shown here in blue, whereas the OCT angiography area uh, is in the red. So to make these areas uh, comparable, what we've done is uh, remove these outer um, squares here so that the areas that we're comparing are comparable. Just to show you a little bit about the population that we analyzed, uh, we have uh, 87 uh, uh, glaucoma uh, um, subjects and we have uh, 64 control subjects. Uh, the age and the axial length and so on is shown there. These patients have very early um, visual field loss, as you can see in the glaucoma population, both with 24 2 and 10-2, but all the structural and the OCT angiography parameters are, are highly significantly different between the two, as we would expect. So our working hypothesis is as follows. Um, if we have uh, the relative difference between perfusion density loss and ganglion cell thickness loss plotted on the y-axis as a function of disease severity, those subjects who sit actually on top of uh, the zero here are those subjects who show relatively more ganglion cell loss, whereas those subjects who have relatively more perfusion density loss will be at the bottom of the graph. And our working hypothesis is that if our data actually um, look something like this, where all the data lie in this sort of format, then our first hypothesis is that the perfusion density loss is, uh, or the perfusion density is more sensitive uh, than the ganglion cell layer thickness um, loss. Whereas if uh, the data actually lie uh, in the opposite um, way, uh, we would then say that hypothesis two, which is that perfusion density loss uh, is actually more sensitive than ganglion cell layer loss. So this is the other hypotheses that we had set up. Now, let's look at the actual data. So the first thing is that we've I've shown you that um, schematic, but now with the real data, here you have mean, sense, mean deviation here on the x-axis, and on the y-axis you have this relative loss. And the first thing you notice is that there's actually very little difference uh, 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 in this relationship. So essentially it tells us that there are actually, um, there's no indication that perfusion density is more sensitive at one end of the spectrum or the other. And what's important to note is that more than 70% of the patients actually have relatively more ganglion cell thickness loss compared to perfusion density loss. And actually, if we look at the 10-2 uh, data, again, there's very, very little relationship. So visual field severity is not a good way of telling us whether perfusion density is a more useful measurement uh, or not. Well, how about looking at our structural measurements? So this is the same um, schematic again, but this time on the x-axis, I have retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and minimum rim width. There is a modest relationship here between um, uh, this uh, asymmetry index and nerve fiber layer thickness loss, which tends to suggest actually that um, perfusion density loss is less important in early damage. In fact, that relatively more ganglion cell thickness loss uh, is important. And I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but there isn't such a relationship in the minimum rim width. Uh, so what we did now is we did a univariate analysis to see which parameters actually are associated with more perfusion density loss uh, 
uh, compared to more ganglion cell layer thickness loss. And there's nothing in the sex or the age or the axial length that separate these two populations. Uh, there's also nothing that separates them in perimetry, as I've shown you um, before. And then finally, uh, when you look at the OCT angiography and the OCT measurements themselves, uh, there are three parameters that are useful. The first is the nerve fiber layer thickness, which I've already alluded to before. But the ones that really stick out are the signal strength. The signal strength for the macular OCT and the signal strength for the OCT angiography. And this tells us that patients who actually have more perfusion density loss tended to have a worse signal strength both on the OCT and on the OCT angiography uh, compared to those with uh, more loss of ganglion cell thickness. So I will um, focus the rest of my talk uh, on this topic. Now, let's then do a logistic regression. So th the analysis that I showed you before was a univariate analysis that didn't control for all confounding factors. So a logistic regression basically puts all of these things together and tells you what are the odds ratios of these various parameters predicting variables that are associated with greater perfusion density loss. Um, so the, the first one that comes up is female sex. And now I, I, I'm not going to focus too much on this because you can see that the confidence intervals are enormous from 1.25 to 48.79. And therefore, I don't really think that this is uh, an important one. And furthermore, this wasn't significant uh, in the univariate analysis. So I think this is just a spurious finding. The nerve fiber layer thickness um, is potentially a finding, and I don't have time to go into why that is, but if there are questions at the end of my session, I do have some slides at the end of the presentation, and I can try to explain this particular finding. But again, you can see that the signal strength, both of the structural OCT and of the OCT angiography, uh, appear to be associated with those subjects who have greater uh, perfusion density loss. So let's just look at the data in a different way now. So uh, this is uh, nerve fiber layer thickness here on the x-axis and the asymmetry index here on the y-axis. And I've shown you this graph before. Uh, but instead of showing you uh, the correlation between these two, I'm actually going to split the data up into tertiles. I split them into equal thirds. And then I'm simply going to count the number of subjects who sit above this horizontal line and below the horizontal line. And here you can see, actually, when you look at these numbers, that there are actually an increasing number of subjects here who have relatively more perfusion density loss as the nerve fiber layer thickness actually increases. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, so now when we look at that for the nerve fiber layer thickness, let's now look at the signal indices. So this is the OCT signal strength, and you can see that this relationship is actually a lot stronger. And then when we um, look at our numbers here, you can see a decreasing number here of subjects here on the, on the bottom part of the graph showing you that fewer and fewer subjects with higher uh, macular OCT signal strength have more perfusion density loss. And finally, when you look at the OCT angiography signal strength, uh, this relationship actually becomes even more obvious that you can see that relatively few subjects here with a high signal strength actually have more perfusion density loss, whereas if you have a higher signal strength, then you are more likely to have more ganglion cell layer thickness loss. So this is actually a fairly strong relationship and not what we were expecting when we started this study because we had thought that some of the other parameters like um, visual field loss or um, even nerve fiber layer thickness would be much more uh, stronger predictors. But to our um, surprise, it was in fact signal strength which determined uh, the degree to which there was perfusion density loss. Just to give you some context here, um, all of these uh, uh, signal images you can see uh, we have signal strengths from 30 to 44. These are all, I would say, exceptionally high quality images. We did not include any images that were uh, poor. And that tells you that even within this range of high quality images, uh, the perfusion density measurements were highly dependent on that. So let me give you an example. So here is a subject uh, who has a signal strength here um, of 34, which is quite high a perfusion density of 24.8. This is what the OCT um, uh, angiography looks like in the superior vascular plexus. And this is an individual here with a high signal strength of 43 with almost identical perfusion density. 
But at first blush, in a busy clinic, when you look at these two, uh, there's actually um, very little difference between them. So by the eye, you are not able to distinguish between these two images, but clearly they have a massive impact on what perfusion density measurement uh, is, is derived from these images. And I want to uh, draw your attention to the fact that uh, signal um, strength may also impact certain things like segmentation. So here is a published paper where you can see progressive changes. But if you look very carefully here, you can see this vascular doubling that occurs in some of these images that could be due um, to poor segmentation or poor image quality. You can also, in fact, see here the appearance and reappearance of perfusion here, probably because of incorrect segmentation. Uh, this next term study here is from our own lab where we've shown that actually correct segmentation actually um, gives you different perfusion values. Here in uncorrected images, you can see this sort of area of blackness, which doesn't make any sense. Um, but actually when those images are corrected, you can see that the perfusion is more accurately uh, reflected here. And also, in fact, you can see perfusion here on the temporal part of the disc, which you couldn't see in the incorrect um, version. Um, so just to point out that, in fact, um, all these issues such as signal strength and uh, segmentation are remarkably important uh, when you look at perfusion density. So to conclude, around two thirds of the patients had more ganglion cell thickness loss compared to perfusion density loss. And there was no evidence that, in fact, there was more or less perfusion density loss uh, with se disease severity, which is not what we'd expected. The signal strength, which I would say is a proxy for image quality, uh, was probably the most significant factor that determined the presence of relatively more perfusion density loss compared to more um, structural loss. Uh, and as I had indicated before, all the images of were, were have very high quality and that clinically it's very difficult to determine the difference between two images with probably statistically significant um, signal strengths. Um, so the bottom line is that it's actually quite difficult, at least in glaucoma, to determine the degree to which glaucoma alone or the severity of glaucoma alone leads to perfusion density loss and that um, things like image quality and image segmentation are probably much, much more important uh, than we give credit for. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bell, for these <clears throat> great questions. And we have a hand up here in the auditorium. And can we maybe have unmuted this question um, from the live audience? So while we work out on the unmuting, the question, one question in the chat is, how many scans did you perform manual segmentations or corrections? So how many scans did you perform and did you segment manually as well? Right. <clears throat> yeah, so these scans, these are, these are um, scans in a, um, in, a, in a longitudinal study. So these are macular scans, which uh, uh, have, uh, the, I forget the exact uh, parameters of the scan, but they're the standard macular scan that we used. Image segmentation was checked. Uh, it wasn't checked for every single line scan, but it was checked uh, for, for alternative line scans to make sure that the segmentation was correct. Now, I have to um, point out that the segmentation in the macula is probably more accurate than it is in, in the nerve head because simply the structures within the nerve head are, are a little bit more irregular, uh, but the segmentation in the macula works relatively well compared to that in the optic nerve head. So these are scans that are acquired as part of a longitudinal study. Uh, the scans were done and inspected, and if the quality was poor, they were repeated. And if the scan quality was less than 25, um, they were not included in the analysis. Okay, we give the live question another try. Can you hear me and introduce yourself? Maybe just an accidental Hand. So, do you think the lower signal strength scans may lose? Hi, hello. Hello? Hello, hi. So, go ahead with your question and introduce yourself, please. Right. Uh, thank you. My name is Hina. I'm from Pakistan. Uh, Mr. Johan, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I just wanted to know that segmentation and uh, signal strength seems to be a big issue with the research that you've just carried out. Uh, would the newer uh, machines that are just on being marketed in, in uh, the Indian subcontinent these days, the CIRS, uh, 
6,000 and 7,000 and many other different machines, they really um, uh, emphasize on improving signal strength and better algorithms at segmentation. Do you think that will make an impact or should we consider that these machines would be better? Is there any research in, in that yeah, so direction? Thank you. So, so first of all, I don't have uh, um, experience with, uh, with any of these uh, other um, um, techniques that you've mentioned. Um, I, you know, I, I wish that the answer to that question is yes, um, but you know, I, I think it would be a mistake uh, to rely completely on automated segmentation because we know that even in the presence of actually excellent quality images with high signal strength, there could potentially be errors in segmentation. So I think that you know, I would urge not just Heidelberg Engineering, but every company actually uh, to focus their 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 energies on 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 assuring uh, that the image segmentation is correct. Um, you know, this is not just an issue for OCT angiography; it's also an issue for structural measurements, of course, because we know that uh, net fiber layer thickness measurements and ganglion cell layer thickness measurements are critically dependent uh, on on um, on segmentation accuracy. And I think one of the advantages of the Spectralis system is that you can actually go into the software and, and correct the segmentation if you want. Many of the devices don't allow you to do that. Um, so I, I think that uh, it's imperative to look at um, segmentation. Obviously, you know, if you're scanning 384 lines, it's impossible to, to check all 384 lines, but, uh, but there should be a mechanism to, 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 to do um, at least spot checking to make sure that there aren't any okay. gross segmentation errors. But it's a much, much bigger issue than we had actually ever anticipated. Thank you. Um, well, if we have shorter questions, we could uh, answer, we could do three, four more questions. So let's go ahead. Professor sure. Sherpa, sure. I unmute you now, and here's your question, or you unmute yourself if you muted yourself, please. Yes, please, your question now. Thank you. Oh, I'm uh, Dr. Sherpa from Nepal. Uh, it's wait for was wearing a presentation regarding OCT NGO. Uh, do you think that uh, we should use it routinely in a clinical practice? OCT so, NGO? Yeah, so that's a very, very difficult question. I can give you a personal answer. Uh, my personal answer is that uh, if you are um, not doing enough visual fields or enough optic disc examinations, then I would say the answer is no. If you have all the time and money in the world, uh, and the patient can tolerate it, go ahead and do it. Uh, the, the, the evidence thus far, thus far, uh, uh, although you know we are relatively new with this technique, is that uh, OCT angiography does not offer a magnitude of advantage over the other techniques, at least as far as we know. Okay, another question from the audience, okay. Dr. Berg. Thanks. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Bieck, so we can hear you. Okay, this is not working, but we have a final question to you. Um, do you think the lower signal strength scans may lose some focal signals, therefore contribute to the reduction of the, of the density measurements? Yes, I would say very much so. Uh, and I think our, our, uh, our, our study probably points to that because I think if you have um, a lower signal strength, it's, it's, you know, one of the factors is that uh, the, the, the signal strength is, is computed as a function of, uh, you know, the signal to noise ratio. And then, of course, if that's lower, then it's quite likely that, that you're not going to detect perfusion. Or it could be the other way around, uh, that if you have a poor uh, image quality, that you may not be able to resolve this uh, uh, perfusion and therefore you have a, a, a loss of perfusion density. So that's very, very much the case, yes. Can you spend say, 10 seconds on the answer? Is there any perfusion density difference in normal tension glaucoma versus primary open ankle glaucoma? Uh, I have no comment on that, Stefan, because I have not looked at that answer, that question rather. Good. It's we uh, are not an interesting question. So, yes. well, we are through it and I allowed all the questions that came and thank you for sharing. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we could have discussed much more, but now it's time to say bye to Halifax, Canada.